black people are monkeys who leave litter on our beaches. Rape of babies is part of black culture. These are just two of the racist outbursts by white South Africans this year. Are they the ravings of crazy individuals or is something deeper going on? Could this be a sign that 22 years into democracy, the social and economic power behind white attitudes and white privilege are limiting South Africa's progress towards equality? And if so, how do we take apart these structures of whiteness? With me to discuss this are Waneli Sakaba, student and activist from UCT, and Four List, Kone Mulder, Chief Whip of the Freedom Front Plus, and Rainbowist, Henny Van Fieren of the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation. Funny man, John Flismas is here. So is writer Rebecca Davis. PJ Powers is in the hizzy. We also have commentators Ivo Vechta, Mwelezi Mbeki, and Ibrahim Harvey. And from national government, we have Abraham Serote, Director of Social Cohesion, and in our audience, we have South Africans from all walks of life. Welcome to you all. <laughs> you at home can send us your comments on racism and inequality. Connect with us on Facebook or on Twitter. But before we start, take a look at this. Mandela dreamed of a non-racial South Africa. In the struggle, white comrades fought shoulder to shoulder with black leaders. Some whites were injured or lost their lives for freedom. There were also white musicians who used their voices to challenge racism. But times have changed. The memories of white South Africans prepared to die for equality have faded. Instead, the headlines are filled with stories of white people spouting hatred superiority and racism. Sparrow insulted black people who were on the Durban beaches over the Christmas period. Sparrow says she will now call black people monkeys. Penny Sparrow and Judge Mabel Jansen may not represent the views of all white South Africans. But perhaps their racism is a sign of things to come in a South Africa in which poverty is expected to be black and wealth white. When we look at uh, racial tensions, especially between white and black South Africans, I think those tensions uh, have been made too much of. Uh, certainly white South Africans don't have the kind of economic and related power that, that they used to. As people interact more in the workplace primarily, which is where we spend almost all of our uh, waking days, um, as we interact more between the races, some of these preconceptions, I think, will disappear. The problem is that we tend to focus on the interpersonal acts of racism, acts of inequality, without understanding that there's an entire structure which makes such interpersonal relations an inevitable outcome. And I think if we focus on the interpersonal, we tend to lose sight of some of the institutional um, and historically entrenched reasons for inequality and racism in South Africa. But also there's a need for a significant asset transfer in South Africa. It cannot be correct that the people who are historically dispossessed of their land through violence, plunder, and rape in this country um, are the same people who still need to beg for that land in order for them to live a life in South Africa. In South Africa in 2016, white families earn six times more than black ones. Many young black South Africans are sick of waiting for Mandela's non-racial society to come about. With the lived experiences of South Africans so far apart and defined by race and poverty, is South Africa headed for an uprising against the Rainbow Settlement? So, Wanelisa, why are you so obsessed with whiteness? Why can't we be preoccupied with being successful in business, in the arts? I mean, like Feriel Hafaji says in her book, what if there were no white people? I think for me, I, I'm not obsessed with, with whiteness. I'm a, obsessed with black liberation. Um, and and I'm, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with the rebuilding of black humanity uh, in this country. Um, so to read my, my obsession with black liberation as uh, you know, an obsession with whiteness, I think is incorrect. 
because we live in, in, a, in a society that is very dishonest about um, the kind of power, the kind of brutality that white bodies, even without doing anything, mm. hold. Mm. And so for PJ Powers to come and sing a very mediocre song and make money over the years um, about using you know, Zulu culture and using cultural appropriation is, is exact kinds of, of power that white people hold in this space. Mm. And there's a generation of young people who are sitting, some of them sitting in this audience, who are moving away from uh, you know, the, the lies of Mandela to say, actually, we want the land at this point in time. Mm. Woo! Good child. <laughs> Peter, I'll, I'll give you the honor of, of replying. Yeah. With regards to Jabalani, um, in 1982, it was probably before you were born, um, I went into um, Soweto with a, a rock song called You're So Good To Me. It didn't have a black note on it. I think some of the older people may remember it. It was You're So Good To Me. It was a rock song that suddenly charted on the Radio Zulu charts. So if you think that I adapted back culture, that is not the case at all. In fact, the black people put me on their wings, okay, and carried me and have ever since. It is something I'm incredibly proud and grateful for. And it hurts me to see somebody that I have fought for my entire life, okay, in my own way, in what I can do. I'm not a politician. I'm not a statistician. I can't do any of those things. What I can do is talk out about whinging whites that we have in this country and I will always have loved and always will love this country. The book that I've written is dedicated to the people of Soweto. All right. Kone, you have it. I call you a rainbowist. I think we all used to be rainbowists at some point or other uh, at the start of our democracy. Yes. Uh, but a lot's changed. A lot has happened. The question is Are why? your ideas still relevant? Absolutely, because the constitution is still relevant whether we like it or not. And we all remember what it was like in 1994 and the whole concept of the rainbow nation. Why do we have this debate today? What changed? I believe that leaders should set the tone. And President Mandela and other leaders at the time set a certain tone in terms of why and how we should take South Africa forward. All right. Rebecca, are all white people racist? A hundred percent. How can you be a white South African and not be racist? And I don't mean that in the way of you necessarily consciously think that black people are inferior. I mean that there is just no way that you could have be born into the society without internalizing racist assumptions. But let's not make that the end of the conversation. It's not racist, it's just a fact. Let's not make that the end of the conversation. Let's say yes, sure, we are all racist and what are we gonna do about it? What, what, let's move on, let's not make that the final insult. Monique, do you agree with Rebecca saying 100%? No, all I white people are racist. I totally disagree with what she's saying. Um, I think that whiteness and white privilege has become this buzzword that you hear all the time. <laughs> but actually, um, it's a way to silence anyone that is not of color. Oh. What she was basically saying is, if you are a white person, you are racist just because you are white, without any evidence. I am not a racist person. I, haven't, I respect all people. I respect black people, white people, colored people. So I feel it's very offensive to, offensive to say that all white people are racist. It's just not true. And um, I think that to make um, whiteness the enemy is um, easier to fight than to fight the crippling corruption, um, to fight unemployment, to fight, um, yeah, to, to fight the wealth gap, um, because the political leaders that we have cannot fight that stuff, they don't have the skills to fight that, and then they make race the problem. Ooh, so I Sarah, feel, sorry, you um, look like you totally disagree yeah. here. I do totally disagree. I think that I'm a little bit torn because I really want to reply to a bit of what Monique has said, but I also really don't want this conversation where we have a potential to disrupt whiteness, to be centered around the type of whiteness that is displaying the racism that you say that you aren't. I mean, the comment about the comment about people not having skills is inherently racist. Yes. Um, just to point out one thing. I think, yeah. and I, think, I think we should have the conversation about how to give back the land. I think that's what we should do. Do you agree with Monique? Well, I think, I, I think that what we need to look at is an element of complicity, Master Chaba. And I think that fundamentally what we haven't unpacked, we've gone through the TRC process, 
And what we haven't understood is how white people have benefited firstly from apartheid, mm. and secondly, how a particular group of white people in this country have become fabulously rich off the back of apartheid. Yes. Now, I think that white complicity, overall we can look at, and the responsibility to promote social justice in our country, <coughs> firstly. But when we have two families, there are two families in this country, the Oppenheimers and the Ruperts, mm -hmm. names we don't necessarily all know, who have as much wealth as 50% of our people. Yeah. It's an extraordinary crime, we should call it nothing else, that must be challenged. It's a crime against our humanity, and that's the humanity of 50 million people in this country. Mm. That's precisely where we need to focus at and say, how did you make your money during apartheid? Yeah. How did you build those networks? Yes, and yes. how do you retain and entrench your power mm -hmm. in, the, in the last 20 years? And quite clearly, no one is disrupting that power fundamentally. Mm -hmm. All right, Lovelyn. I think what, what Nelisa was trying to raise earlier about, you know, PJ's song, yes, you know, struggle hero, or you fought and whatever. I think the problem is that we forget that white people today have the option of tapping out. Right? So you can sing Jabulani and you can dance, but then you can also remove yourself from the lived experiences of the culture Did that you're trying. Tap I'm sorry, I'm speaking. Sorry. From the from the culture that you're that you're trying to represent. <laughs> that doesn't make you a bad person. It's just the truth of the situation. And I think in South Africa this is really what the conversation needs to be about. We need to talk about why did apartheid end? Why did colonialism end? Mm. It didn't end because people's perspectives and behavior changed. It ended because it was expensive. It ended because white people couldn't travel anymore. It ended because they couldn't go and play sport, because entertainment for white people was over. Therefore, they needed to bring equality. That's not, we need to be honest. We must be honest about this. So for me, so, so for me, when we want to have this conversation, it's easy to say, let's talk about the Rainbow Nation. Of course you can look forward if your life was never tainted by the, ex by the experience of apartheid. Of course you can look forward. It's not the same. And that's the experience of being black, constant, constantly having to reconcile your existence, reconcile your hum humanity, and demand respect and demand a level of, of humanity as opposed to what other people just get automatically by being white. That's the reality. You don't have to label it as racism if you don't want to, but it is what it is. All right. <laughs> we do also have to think about what whiteness means. Is it about skin color? You have said that perhaps we need to target the black elite. What are your thoughts so far? Well, uh, there was a comment about Oppenheimer and Rupert, but what about Patrice Musepe? Mm. He's a multi-billionaire, yes. so Thank why you. aren't you mentioning him? What about uh, Cyril Ramaphos? That's another mul uh, multi-billionaire in this country. What we're talking here, black liberation. Black liberation, we achieved black liberation Jesus. in 1994. Oh. Okay, you may, you may not well, like it's not it. Felt in this you, room. May think you, you may think you got nothing out of it, but we have a class of black people here who are multi, multi. As we million should have. Yes, it is their country. We saying, should have I'm, rich black I'm people. I'm not saying you shouldn't have them. Oh, I don't. say we don't have, blacks are not oh, oppressed dear. by anyone in South Africa. Yeah. Wow. If they are, tell me who's oppressing them. If All right. they are oppressed, so if who we is are oppressed, oppressed if we are oppressed, Wanelisa, who is oppressing us? I, I think I, I hear what you're saying because, you know, you running your books and, and the political elite in the ANC are not oppressed because you are doing the oppressing at the moment, along with white you. You, 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 you are the gatekeeper of whiteness. You represent the gatekeeper of whiteness. And, and you sold us out. You sold us out. And, and, and to say that you fought for my freedom, you didn't fight for anything because I'm not free at the moment. I said, I merely said I did what I could. And one other thing, do you think for a second, I as a white person do not agree with both you and you? Have you ever thought that maybe I agree with you? Yes, I don't care. Yeah, I don't care. At mind. this point in time, <laughs> white feelings, white opinions exactly. don't matter don't to me. Care. Because right. I need the exactly. land. Ladies, I need the land. Because I, I need to live with the land. land. Oh, I love the land. I'd love to come to you, Tiens. It is unacceptable that e inequality is so high in our country. <laughs> A Gini coefficient of 65% is the second highest in the world, if not the highest in the world. 
The question I think we should ask is how can that be changed? Now there are people here saying, give us the land, then that will change. That may be. I want to say, what is the biggest empowering mechanism in any government's hands, in any nation's hands? <laughs> no, no, it's <laughs> education. <laughs> what, I, what I'm perplexed about is that instead of holding a democratically elected government accountable after 22 years, mm. what do we focus on? On 10 million or 10% or people in the country. The 10% who, who, who own the majority of the government. Not all of them. You own the so government. I'm, I'm, I mean, you know, we can say, city of the land, I've got the constitution here. Yes, let's work with the constitution and the national the development plan and, plan and go forward. We shouldn't. We should hold this government and all the political parties accountable. What about rich black people? Yes. So who mm. who mistreat other black people, mm. like Kulubu Sezuma, mm. who's mm. now been forced by the courts to pay his 5,300 workers. Mm. What about him? In South Africa, it happens to be that the majority of white South Africans, just by virtue of their existence and the access to assets and everything that they have, are very much the huge culprits in this conversation. No, it doesn't mean, I'm yeah. sorry, no, it doesn't no. mean, yeah. it doesn't mean, no, no, no. It doesn't mean, right, it doesn't mean that there are black people that are doing things that are wrong. But why is that the immediate equal of it in the conversation? Are we, c will we then acknowledge that the entire apartheid machinery was also corrupt and that, and that you know, that it was affirmative action for white people? Yeah. All right, Henny, you, you've actually documented how um, white fortune was made. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, Mr. Chaba, I think firstly, I th we need to appreciate our country was at war, right? And our country was at war for decades. And the last 10 or 15 years of that war saw all manner of crime. In order for the apartheid regime to be able to buy weapons, to buy oil, for large corporations to move their cash offshore, they broke all the rules in the book and made a network of people around the world incredibly wealthy out of that process and people in our country. Mm -hmm. So I think for us as a nation, again, to move forward, we need a full understanding. For there to be true justice in our country, there has to be truth. And I think when it comes to economic justice, this is a crucial element that must be the focus of us moving forward. Mm. All right, Abraham, you have a very big job. You're responsible for social cohesion uh, at the Department of Arts and Culture. Can you bring everybody together? Um, I think it's, it's possible. Uh, government has 14 priorities uh, for this medium term uh, strategic framework period. Uh, and though the 14th priority of this current government is social cohesion and nation building. And we have a program of action to, to achieve that. We Wonderful. We're going to yes. leave it at just one of the 14, <laughs> given uh, our time limitations. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. And we'll be expanding on, on parts of that when we get to the more conclusive part of this conversation. So when we return, we hear about the good racist and we talk about the return of apartheid in South Africa. You're watching The Big Debate. Um. Hi everyone, my name is John and I have a new show, that's why I'm here, it's called The Good Racist. Okay, I can't speak for anyone else in this room, I know everyone's very angry and very cross, but all I know is I was born confused. Because I was born in, well I was actually born in Zimbabwe, but let's not discuss that, I swam hard and I'm here now. <laughs> I was raised in a racist environment. Every rule, every nuance, everything told me that black people were dangerous and incompetent and evil. Then my parents went to work every day and left me alone with one. So, <laughs> so the problem is that it doesn't even make sense. If the old people didn't even believe what they were teaching us, how are we supposed to process that? So, so that's the first thing, I think. And then the other thing we must accept is that racism is something which is definite. It's real, it's there, it's an absolute, and it comes out in sneaky ways. African time. What exactly is this concept of African time? It didn't exist before we came here. There was no African time. Things just happened, okay? Nothing didn't get done. Stuff got done. You never saw Shaka Zulu standing on a hill going, ow, where are these tozas? I want to have a battle. <laughs> Stuff just happened, right? Then we came on three ships, okay, and made everyone a slave, and now we want you to be on time. Well, what kind of idiot would you be to arrive on time for your own oppression? <laughs> Thank you very much.
Welcome back to the big debate with me, Masachaba Njovu. We're talking about whiteness. We're talking about white privilege. So it's good to have a laugh. That was John Flismus, comedian in chief. But now on to the serious stuff. So let's talk about Penny Sparrow. She was used to white beaches, having her own space, without any monkeys around, and so-called human beings to share the, the, her beach with. Just like people in Parkhurst or in, in Bishop Court or, or Clough are used to uh, white restaurants. In other words, our cities are still segregated. So let's hear from some people who live far from the white suburbs, Simpiwe from Tembelihle, where there have been many service delivery protests. Simpiwe, you are here. So are there any white people that live in Tembelihle? No, actually, in Temelitle, it's just a big informal settlement where we'll find the poor people who are living in shacks with no electricity, no toilets, even water, because everything that we have is the things that we did on our own, like illegal electricity, mm. connecting water, like buying pi pipes for ourselves to connect water so that we can ha have access to water. Actually, when we go out, like Santin, uh, Rosebank, it's like we are uh, in the other country when we compare where mm. we, we, we are from, actually. We end up uh, breaking even the law by connecting electricity on our own mm. and we'll, st we'll take it from the, the Indian communities to bring it to informal settlement. People will die each and every day because of the praise that we use when it's winter. Our shacks will burn because we use the candles. We've got signers. Some of people they don't see in their eyes because of the smoke of the paraffin. So that is uh, how we live. Do you think it's got something to do with uh, being black and the fact that you're not white? Yes, it is. Because uh, since I was born, I never saw any um, info informal settlement that uh, I'll be told that uh, whites are staying in this informal settlement. The informal settlements are the thing of blacks. Everywhere where you go, you'll find blacks in those informal settlements. Wow. So how does that make you feel about white people? I won't blame the whites for whatsoever that happened because uh, our parents fought for, for the freedom, uh, thinking that uh, as blacks, we'll have our land back, we'll have uh, priorities like on other things, like at schools, we saw the, the, uh, the protest of um, UJs and stuff, the universities were protesting. We thought such things, we won't see those things anymore. I thought because now it's a black government, will be like, feeding our study, but it's not happening also. So both parties <coughs> are playing part on this thing of racism or um, what, yeah, in our future. So, well, let's see, it is all about race then. It's not all about race. You know, we have an ANC government. Hold on, hold on. All right. Be but you said there's been black liberation. I, yes, I, that's why I'm saying there has been black liberation. Now I'm explaining mm. why I say there has been black liberation. Mm. We have the, the ANC controls the government of South Africa. It controls the parliament of South Africa. It controls the police of South Africa. It controls the army of South Africa. So now my sister here says she wants black liberation. I have been asking her during the interval, she needs to explain to us who is being oppressed by whom and who, how is she going to liberate I think Tembe, uh, I think um, Simpiwe has answered that no, for No, no, she didn't. Mm. She you said she's not blaming white people. She didn't say white people put her into the informal settlement. But, but now you're not dealing with my question. Sure, sure, no problem. But you asked two questions. Who is being oppressed and who is doing the oppressing? She's oppressed. By people who? who live in Tembelitle are oppressed. By who? Maybe we need to answer that question. Kone? I think we should um, look at all the facts. I can assure the gentleman, the lady, unfortunately, that I can assure you there are some white informal settlements today in uh, South Africa. How many? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How many, how, many, how many white people are living in squatter camps? If you don't like the facts, it's no use to shout. You have to accept How that there's many? a reality. In ter obviously, in terms of percentages, it's a lesser percentage. So Lovelyn? For me, an ideal South Africa 
With BS South Africa, where we have white maids, white security guards, white people in informal settlements, and then we have more black people in positions, you know, as more black lawyers, more black accountants, more black people living in decent housing, etc. All right, Ayabonga, who's doing the oppressing? Look, I think it's a combination of the historically white entrenched and established interests in South Africa, combined with, of course, this new black elite that uh, Utatumpegi is talking about. I mean, if you think about BEE, it's all it is is just crumbs trickling off the white table in service and in perpetuation mm. and in continuation of the of the ritual. Mm. I just want to say something. You know, the okay. most disempowering, destructive and devastating racism is not personal racism. The penny sparrows <coughs> can spew as much racist filth mm. as they want to. It doesn't kill anyone. You must address the fact that the ANC left intact, virtually untouched, this, when Malema and them speak about white monopoly capital, it's not a myth. Yeah. It's a devastating yeah. reality in the lives of people. Yeah. So, you know, the, the question of the black elite, <laughs> it's true they're feeding from the crumbs that fall from the table of white monopoly capital, but what you also need to address is that the intra, intra-racial, meaning within the black population, growing class inequalities has now ups, outstripped the interracial inequalities between black and white. This is it. The Anglo-Americans, all of these people dominate this economy. Mm -hmm. This bloodless, uh, this jobless bloodbath that Bavi speaks about is a direct consequence of the fact that this economy, where it's a powerful country, we live in the most powerful city in Africa, Johannesburg, and people are living in shacks. That is the most important racism that's linked to the uh, to institutional structural issues that I want to hear more about, and I'm not hearing that. I don't want to talk about the penny sparrows. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna take a short break. You are watching The Big Debate. Yella duck. Yella can ons ergernis vat. Wanneer yella het ons naas je gevat. Ek het van my mense voor jy gewaski that Yella is ons land so I have a disease that must be contained into townships. Please understand that snuffing out your lights at night was our way of keeping our hopes alive and yours from resurfacing. No, wait, I'm sorry for my blood, that not enough of it was shed, that the blood on me was always yours, not mine, that every step I take leaves footprints in your blood. I'm going to breathe in and dissolve reconstitute myself in the air, throw my bones for you, bonfire my skin as sacrifice, freeing myself for me, for you, for the stars that shine white in the black sky. No, wait, they shine jewel colors and the sky is blue to purple. No, wait, the stars are fading. The sky flashes blood red, settles into velvet. The moon is yellow orange, colors roam only in browns and I can finally breathe because I am the small particles of dark I have always been and I have nothing to do with explosions. No. Wait. <laughs> you forget to mention that whiteness was a prerequisite, so I guess the helix of your DNA is the corporate ladder that you climb to be above us. Even our flag segregates us, betrays us, by trading in the fields and gold that you bought with our blood on our land. Welcome back to the big debate on race, inequality, and whiteness. I'm Masa Chabandlovo, and you've just been listening to Tepo Molefe and Sarah Gotsell, who is a young poet. They both are. Sarah happens to be the daughter of Bobby Gotsell, the former CEO of Anglo Gold Ashanti. Thank you both so much for making the time to be here. That was one heck of a poem. And the part that particularly stood out for me was when you said you're sorry that not enough of your blood was shared. Mm. The poem is supposed to be an apology that shows that it's never big enough, that it's never enough, that's the no weight. Um, and you've also referenced my, my father. I'm living in a legacy that I'm trying to undo. What do you mean when you say that you are living a legacy that you're trying to undo? 
I'm trying to find ways to live that will actively speak to the project of disrupting whiteness, of disrupting myself, um, but at the same time, I'm not wanting to make it about me. To the point about education, land speaks to wealth, which speaks to education, you know, so how everything, how everything is tied and how we can address, how I can address all the aspects of that in my personal um, and whatever other capacities that I have. So do you think capitalist, wealthy, white families like the Ruperts should give, give away their land, give away their money? Yes. All right. All right, so Monique, I'd like to bring you here uh, into the conversation. <coughs> We've heard a poem that absolutely captures white guilt. Are you, do you feel guilty? I feel that I don't have to apologize because I personally did not say fought in apartheid. And in my heart, so I feel sorry. So can we say no? Yeah, I feel you don't sorry feel guilty. for e each and every person that was um, disadvantaged by apartheid. But oh, you can't say that young people today still have to apologize. We also want to. I don't think anyone's just asking for an apology. I think that happened with the TRC. So, Juan Elisa. You know, you know, Mr. Chaba, I'm sitting as a black, poor, dispossessed woman in this country and having to listen to Monique saying she's not guilty. But I'm living under white supremacy right now. And we, we, we skip away of the violence of white supremacy because we, we talk about the township, we talk about poverty as, as things that are, that, are, that are, it's just irrelevant. That lady's story is so powerful because it's the story of my mother, it's my story, it's, it's the story of every black person in this room who has been dispossessed, who lives under violence every day in this country. So I'm sorry, Sarah, I don't want you to live in ways that, that, that you want to give back the land because I want to take back the land because for me, psychologically, it's very important that I take back the land. You don't give it back to me because it was taken back forcefully under, under colonialism. So I want to decolonize this country. And maybe if it means that the, an army of black people in this country take arms in order to do that then maybe it needs to happen but i'm tired of these i'm tired of these debates but, i'm tired of these but debates is that progressive or regressive do we need to have war for that to happen i don't think so what do you think when you've taken the land back when you've taken the land back make sure you give it to the rightful owners in terms of the truth give it to the koi and the sun people there yes they are the rightful owners if you want to take back the land, give it to the rightful owners. But you see, the problem is this. So are you saying that black people are also not the rightful owners of this land? If the black people are the rightful owners, where did they get the land? Where is that what you're saying? No, no, no. History is much more complicated than that. Much more complicated. And we can go and have a look at that. But it's a myth. It's a myth to just claim that everything belonged to this, no, but nothing belonged to that. It's a myth. If people start talking about war, we are in a very, very dangerous situation. It's very easy to incite violence. You don't know what you're talking about, and I would suggest that we all move away from that. Wait, 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 wait a second. Hold on that. a second. And luckily, luckily I know that the majority of people in this country from different communities are not interested in violence. They are not interested in conflict and war. Those are side elements that should not be allowed to destroy the fabric of social cohesion in this country. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Social cohesion. Um, if you want my land, you can come and take it right now. I've never owned any land anywhere, ever. I'd like to make a proposal, though. Right? In, in all these debates, a, lo a lot of people forget Right, that our government actually owns almost half of all the land in no, South Africa. No, that's not true. Don't lie, don't lie. At national, at national, don't lie, don't lie. You're lying. You're lying. At, you're lying. at national and you're provincial level, lying. it's twenty-four percent, and at, at at municipal level, we don't really know, but you're we estimate about twenty-five percent. All right, let's let him finish. Also, also, also the government <laughs> owns a lot of national assets in terms of state-owned enterprises, right? And a lot. It's not only the big guys. No, that, <laughs> Why would the government straight. need to own a diamond mine? Right? Now, the government could, in uh, <coughs> very short order, right, make a huge dent in economic inequality. I'm not saying it's going to solve all the problems, right, but make a huge difference right, by giving that back to the people. Right? It used to belong to the apartheid government, now it belongs to the ANC government. Right? 
go go along with the Freedom Charter. Say, let the people own these national assets. Right? They did that with telecom. They did that with telecom to an extent. All right. Okay. <laughs> Henny, are we destined for war? I don't think we should wish for war. I think, Master Chaba, we speak easily about it, and I understand our frustration, but I think we must... In respecting those who have fought for our freedom and who have fallen, we shouldn't wish this thing back upon us. But equally, mu equally must, and it is our freedom for all of us and a responsibility to act. And I, and I say equally for white people to act responsibly. And while we talk about the land issue, and it is fundamental, I think equally we have to talk about our economy. We have to say every year about 300 billion rand leaves this, this country in capital that very wealthy people own, which they move offshore. It's a fundamentally unpatriotic act that happens of undermining the future of this country. It's that which we need to equally hold responsible to say to those who have money that we are going to look at ways in which that money must be reinvested in the future of all of our people. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to take a short break. When we return, the final word from our audience and our panel. This is The Big Debate. Welcome back to the big debate on racism, inequality, and white privilege. South Africa is certainly more divided than ever. What will it take to create a real non-racist society? I, I think it's very important for us not to individualize this issue because I do think that, that one, uh, we are already in an incredibly um, polarized um, uh, condition at the moment over the past few, that's been rising over the past few years. So the thing is, we are in a situation of contestation. Let's keep up that political contestation around ideas. What are the best models? What are the, the best ways to dismantle whiteness, dismantle white privilege, and, and, and look at, and, and, but to throw out the constitution in the process, to say we need a war to, 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 to fix this, I think is, is actually um, uh, not, not, um, not actually giving credence to the lives that were lost, to the very hard battles that were fought, I think we need to understand that there is no vehicle in this country that is being used to drive social cohesion. Uh, apartheid fell after the clerk had a whites-only referendum, after the sports movement was crippled in this country. I think we need to look at a vehicle that can drive us forward. Roads must fall indeed, but there's lots of other things that need to fall along with it. When land was violently taken from black people, it was taken as a resource to, to life, to access to life. When 35,000 families own 80% of the land in South Africa, they own the economy of South Africa. The struggle towards um, building a new country that is black because South Africa is first and foremost a black country that should portray African values. That struggle should only be led by black people. I incidentally don't share the idea that the problem that we're dealing with here is whiteness. It's capitalism. The deal that was signed uh, at Codessa was calculated to preserve the ownership of the commanding heights of the economy, the banks, the mines, the big commercial farms and so forth, in the hands of the capitalist class. The basis of that agreement was that ways would be opened for the aspirant black elite represented by the ANC to be given some crumbs in the form of BEE as I think Mwilet Simbeki in his book about, about the subject has so eloquently explained. I'm not interested, by the way, in a society in which we are ruled by black billionaires instead of white billionaires. We do not want any kind of billionaires at all so that the wealth of this country is owned and controlled by the overwhelming majority. We don't want, we don't want equality of poverty. What we want is equality of wealth. Steve Biko questioned whether there would be space for all of us at the rendezvous of victory. And the thing is that there can be space for all of us, but the onus is on white South Africans to recognize their unearned privilege, to realize that white racism is self-destructive, and to commit themselves to use the power they have to advance transformation. 
It's a decision that white South Africans have to make. And unless they make the right decision, they are endangering themselves and there's no one else to blame. Uh, it's been very disturbing to hear comments like, how disempowered am I really if I'm able to go to an institution of higher learning? Firstly, you do not know the cost at, that which, at which that came. Black kids have to go and prove how poor they are just to get a loan from NASFAS, and then you are not poor enough. So you still can't pay your loans, you need to. So that was very disturbing. And secondly, you cannot continue to tell us that education is the key and not the land when black graduates are standing on the street corners with signs. You're watching The Big Debate. When we come back, closing statements from our panel. Welcome back to The Big Debate. I'm Masa Chabandlovu. Don't forget to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. And now, let's get a final word from our panel. I'm an optimist, I'm a positive person, and I think that we still have wonderful things to achieve in South Africa. But we have to celebrate our diversity. Together we can make a success of this country. I'm committed to do so, and I think the majority of our people will do the same. <laughs> Lovelyn. I think that in as much as the systems of oppression have, benefit pe have benefited people at a group level, I think that at a group level, people have a responsibility of undoing those systems. And so when people say, what must white people do to undo their white privilege? It needs to be a very deliberate daily action. It means paying your workers better. It means respecting black people. It means not talking down to black people. It means, you know, allowing and even, you know, reducing the amount of space you take so that other black people can just feel human and dignified in a space. Mm. It has to be deliberate and I think this conversation is not going to end until it's deliberate and until white people are as uncomfortable in their own skin as black South Africans have been. Sarah. I really just want to echo those statements that it's an active process of working towards disrupting whiteness, to, of working towards decolonization, um, and that no white South African should feel comfortable in their skin. I mean, who cares what I think, really? I think that the <laughs> most important decisions in this country are not mine to make, and that the sooner white South Africans realize this is a black country, the better. I believe, as I said, inequality is unacceptable, must be changed. I think racism must be rooted out. I think intolerance, as I've seen in this debate, must also be rooted out. And I do think that if we take the Constitution and we take the Freedom Charter, that the land belongs to everyone who lives in it, white and black, we can go forward. Thank you. All right. The thing is, if you antagonize d different groups and different races, right, this is only going to go one way and that's going to end up in war. Right now, there, there are solutions. There are ways of uh, dealing with this, and the government can make a huge dent in inequality simply by uh, its own policy towards state-owned enterprises, mm -hmm. towards state-owned land, uh, and how, for that matter, it regulates business. Thank you. Let them beg. We have seen the war in Syria, what it does, and I strongly discourage those who think it will solve the problems of South Africa by us fighting amongst a civil law amongst us South Africans. Thank you. Um, I think the, 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 the discussions around <coughs> not inciting war are, are, very, are, are based on and, and not understanding um, how uh, the concentration camps currently known as townships are actually war zones. There's an urgency uh, for for black people to be able to breathe in their own country in their own land mm -hmm. that uh, and and that's a necessary process that needs to happen and and decolonization uh, uh, on a structural level the economy education uh, medicine everything needs to happen in this country and 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 you know, it foundations like the Declack Foundation, by criminalizing uh, young people who are angry, who can't breathe, who are in so much pain, in a, in a violent system, is only just, as this gentleman behind me had said, is just speeding up that process. Thank you. Abraham? Land restitution is important. Uh, economic redress is important. Uh, 
you can't just say as long as you overthrow capitalism, then you'll have uh, you know, attain total societal transformation. That level of reductionism actually makes nonsense of a very complex uh, project that, that, that you're involved in. That's not cool. What, what potentially makes nonsense of our democratic project must be the concentration of power in the hands of small groups of people. Ultimately, I think that is what the fight against racism ultimately is about. And equally, what the fight against the ownership of the economy in the hands of very few people is about. So I think for us to be able to look at a future as a country, it has to be to dealing with uh, economic inequality and, and dealing with the power that very, very few people have in our country uh, and the dispossession that that results in. Thank you, Henry. I think it is very important to keep on with this uh, debate and to keep it honest and frank. So, um, yeah, so everybody should be heard and everybody's view should be respected. I strongly believe that education is a crisis in this country and that will help to dissolve inequality. So there is 80% of schools in South Africa is dysfunctional and that is um, unacceptable. Thank you very much. Well, it seems racism is not just about attitudes. It's also about the power to harm other people's lives. And in South Africa today, millions of black people's lives are damaged by an economy and a society which is rigged in favor of the rich. And the richest South Africans are still mostly white. Can we find a way to build a truly just society for all South Africans? You decide. Thank you for watching The Big Debate.